Before I start talking about the science, I want to talk about three things, one small story that characterized Boris for me. One was his ability to think. He had this incredible database. He knew everything about everything. You've heard about that in the other fields. But when it came to microbial physiology, it was not distant. It was kind of like him talking about family. He understood and had the database that he could bring in, but then he had the ability to analyze. He would ask the impertinent question, and he would ask you to ask the impertinent question. And one of the comments he made was, I try to follow my own path when I'm thinking. The other thing was his generosity. Uh, Lenny was talking about the controversy between black RNA as being beta uh, galactosidase coming from messenger RNA or otherwise. And it was my job to test that. And there was this new method out there. It was a wonderful new method. It was called filter hybridization. And nobody could do this. This was back in 1969. Nobody could do this, there was, and there was only one gene. If you didn't work, you either had to work with Lambda or you, you forgot it. But, but Saul Spiegelman had developed a method to do this, and Boris said, go down to Columbia and uh, to Spiegelman's lab, and they'll show you how to do this. Well, I was a postdoc, and I had two kids. That kind of gives you a feeling about what my, what my monetary value was at that point. <laughs> you know, Boris, he could have said to, to go to England, it would have been about the same thing. And I said, Boris, I don't have any money to do that. And he reached in his wallet, and he opened his wallet, and he took out all of the money that was in his wallet. I still remember the amount to this day. It was $55. And he said, here, and my reaction was, this is unbelievable. And that was Boris. The other thing was freedom. Because while I went to his lab and worked on bacteria, he gave me the freedom to work on yeast. And that's where the whole career started. And that's the story I'm going to tell you this afternoon. But it was his ability to think and his ability to analyze. He never accepted just at face value. He always asked, what does this predict? And that's what I'd like to tell you. Because In fact, I really owe my career to Boris because he gave me the freedom. This is the first paper we published together. It wasn't on bacteria. Mind me, that was the lack thing where we actually showed that it is, it does keep increasing because it's, it's a constant rate. But this was a paper he let me do with Trish Whitney. It was to work on the last two enzymes of this pathway, which then turned into a career for me. And there was a controversy. And he said, does it make sense? What does it predict? And it was out of that that came this pathway that we then spent the rest of our career working on. And the thing that's special is GLIN3, the molecule that he and Aaron Mitchell discovered together, is the molecule that activates all of this and we've, wondered, we've tried to study how does that occur and over the years. And since <clears throat> some of you probably don't think about yeast every day, I thought I'd just give a little bit of background. That is, yeast lives in two very different environments. Sometimes life is good. Rotting vegetables, fruits. 
And when life is good, there's excess nitrogen. In the laboratory, that's going to be glutamine or asparagine, ammonia. You'll recognize these from Boris. And these poor nitrogen sources don't work so well. And so you, the cell doesn't need them. And so the transcription of the cognate genes is highly repressed. And it is repressed because GLIN3 is very straight, tightly sequestered in the cytoplasm. However, a rainstorm and life is a bust because those cells will be washed into the soil and then they do the best they can on anything they can find. And then scavenging those <coughs> compounds become useful and these genes are derepressed. And they're derepressed because GLIN3 goes into the nucleus and activates that transcription. And we wanted to know how did that work? And we had done a lot of work with that over the years, but then this molecule burst on the scene, the rapamycin. And it came, it was isolated out of a bacterium on Easter Island. In fact, they put up a, they put up a plaque for it. It was sufficiently <laughs> <important>. <laughs> And the seagulls promptly decorated it for them. <laughs> but rapamycin is an inhibitor of a molecule called TOR, a target of rapamycin. Mike Hall was very ingenious when he named that protein. And what TOR is, it's actually two complexes. The TOR kinase complexes are serine threonine complexes. And clinically, they're really important. Uh, you have them on stents to prevent inflammation, plugging the stents. You have them in tissue rejection treatment. You have them now in a whole bunch of different cancer trials. And when torque is active, it's a global regulator, and all kinds of stuff gets activated. That is, things that would occur and support growth. When it is not activated or down-regulated, all of these other things are activated. But when it is activated, these are all turned off. And so it integrates and brings together and then controls in a global way the response of the cell to very many different things. And we wanted to know how this worked. And one of the most engaging models that I have heard was a model proposed by uh, Mike Hall. And according to that model, when it tore was active, the TAP42 protein was phosphorylated and it formed a complex with this CIT4-phosphatase, and it was inactivated it. Well, in poor nutrients, or treating the cells with rapamycin, this uh, phosphatase became active. It could then uh, dephosphorylate GLIN3. Boris had shown that GLIN3 and URI2, long before this work was ever done, he showed that GLIN3 and URI2 were in fact formed a complex. And with this dephosphorylation, that complex then was hypothesized to fall apart and GLIN3 then to go into the nucleus. And this was an intriguing model. This probably changed the field as much as anything. And I was asked to do a review on that. And as I went through, I started asking questions of the type that Boris asked me. What are the predictions of the model? And one of the first predictions was, was that this should be have the highest activity in a poor nitrogen source, and I'm sorry, in a good nitrogen source, and the highest activity in a poor one. And when we actually did the experiment, it was just the opposite. CIT4 was most active in glutamine, where it should not have been active at all, and it was least active in proline. And the other member of the family, it was just the opposite. And we subsequently showed the different targets were independent of TOR. But then we ask another question, and it was again the question of what does it predict? And that is, we ask, how did TOR come, how did this research come about, and how did it develop? And basically, it worked in the following way. Five methods were interchangeably used over this period of time to downregulate torque activity. Most of the experiments were run pretty much the same way. That is, you trigger downregulation with one of these five different methods, starvation, limitation, a glutamine synthetase inhibitor, leucine starvation. Notice that all of these related to nitrogen. And then you follow a downstream reporter event. And so the question was that we ask is, are all of these methods physiologically equivalent? It's exactly the question that Boris would ask. 
And when we asked that question, we said, how can you tell? But it makes a prediction. And the prediction is, is this the, it is the question, is this the way it happens? If it is, that torque integrates all of these signals and then it feeds out and the downstream reporter is what's going to active, uh, respond to those signals, then if the answer is yes and you pick one reporter, then the five methods will give you the same results and likely have the same phosphatase requirements. If the answer is no, then maybe you'll see different results, different phosphatase requirements. And so we did the experiment, and there's not time to tell you about that. But in fact, they are all physiologically different. When nitrogen is high, you treat the cells with rapamycin, then three goes right into the nucleus. And, but it requires both SIT4 and PP2A. However, if you limit nitrogen, a poor nitrogen, or a short-term starvation, which is not starvation, it's just limitation, and again, GLIN3 goes in, but it doesn't require PP2A any longer, only SIT4. If it's a long-term starvation, where now nitrogen has decreased to the point where the cells are going to G1 arrest to protect themselves, now there are no requirements at all of either phosphatase. It's totally independent. And if you treat them with the glutamine synthetase inhibitor, exactly the same thing happens. And again, without any phosphatase requirements. And that brought us to the last one, which is leucine starvation, or treating the cells with leucine tRNA synthetase inhibitors. This is the elegant work of, of Claudio de Verglio that has appeared over the last few years. And if you starve the cells for leucine, GLIN3 doesn't move at all, it just sits there and looks at you. It doesn't respond, whatever. And so, yet for SCH9 phosphorylation, it dephosphorylates the way you expect it to. In other words, the whole thing, there are different, meth there are different requirements and there are different outcomes. And this, as a hypothesis, again, Boris would ask, what do you do next? And the next was, it, if this, uh, there are distinct modes of responsive regulation, then there should be targets on that GLIN3 molecule. If it's responding to all of these differently, then where are the targets for that? And we set about to see if we could identify those. And the first one, and as Aaron here can tell you, working with GLIN3 is a really challenging molecule. Uh, it's labile, there's not much of it, it's big, it's mostly serine and threonine, and between Steve, uh, Steve Zeng and our lab, we've identified the functional uh, domains of the protein. This third here at the end, though, nothing much was known about it. We knew it interacted with TOR, but that's all we knew about it. And so the question was, maybe we can find targets. And so we did, and this Boris would not have done. <laughs> because it's just too brute force. What Boris thought, he thought elegantly. And that's the characteristic of his thinking. It's one I've never been able to, to match or to even come close to. He was elegant in th his thinking. And of course, this is about as inelegant as you get. You just go through and you start mutating these things, four or five at a time. And the thing that was interesting is these mutants had a wild type phenotype. They had no phenotype at all. And my reaction, oh my gosh. And by the time we got to here, it was really bad. And when you see red bars, that's GLIN3 in the cytoplasm nucleus and the cytoplasm. The green bars, it's in the nucleus. And as you can see, the wild type and the mutant, they look the same. We got here, though, and the rapamycin disappeared. It had no effect at all. You also lost about half of the sequestration. That's not data scatter. That's real. And so there were two things. Both of those things you'd predict to be with TOR. We said, well, if that works once, let's try it again. And so. I'm sorry, we looked at that and projected it, uh, it had a uh, predicted to form into a helix. Well, when we actually modeled it, all of the hydrophobic residues, one side of the helix, all of the polars were on the other. Here's those series. And we said, well, if that's true, and those other things didn't have a phenotype, then maybe this thing interacts with TOR. So we took 17 amino acids, no more, and put it in and said, does it inter interact in a two-hybrid assay? And the answer is yes, beautifully, just like the full-length protein. Mutate those, in, those serines, and it all goes away. So we had one. And we said, can we find another? Sorry.
And so we took and did another stretch, and these had just the opposite. Every mutation had a strong phenotype, but they were quantitatively identical phenotypes. And every single one of them. And at the end, there was again a helix. And this time, all that was lost was the response to rapamycin. There was no loss of the sequestration at all. Nitrogen repression, which is a word we coined in 1972, it came from Boris. It came from carbon catabolite repression, which Boris had coined. And the nitrogen repression, it was fine. And again, this had a high confidence level of being a helix. We looked at that, and as you can see, again, it has that same structure, the hydrophobics on one side, polars on the other, and in this case, there was a serine, these blue guys, right in the middle. When that was mutated, again, the rapamycin was lost. And so now there are two. And that brings us to where we are today. As you can see, my career's been very tightly entwined with Boris. He's the reason I have it. And we have two targets. Where are the rest? And so Boris's legacy continues, not only in CLIN3, but in us his intellectual children, our children, and now our grandchildren.